Good evening, everyone. Uh, I think it's uh, time to go and uh, get started. I am sure there are a lot of people uh, who want to join because we got more than now. Uh, 400 uh, plus people interested to participate uh, in the webinar. But yeah, so uh, there are a lot of people do in the waiting list. I'm trying to add them. Apologies for a couple of minutes of delay. Uh, we, should, we should go ahead and get it started. All right, uh, yeah, uh, without a delay, let me just start the webinar. Uh, Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the session uh, webinar on uh, electric vehicle powertrain uh, uh, simulation and sizing. So um, a very important topic and the topic of uh, industry today where everybody is talking about, you know, reducing their time to market and, and there's so much of uh, uh, fast phase adoption of EVs uh, that requires uh, a faster phase of testing and, and the tools like simulations are helping us to reduce these timelines and to make you know, things go faster in the market. So that, that's that been a good in case uh, on the one side, but yeah, as a scope of this uh, session, we will not touch base on uh, various different types of simulation. We would touch base uh, majorly on powertrain and specifically, I would say the sizing of powertrain components, right? So that is uh, the major motive uh, for the today's uh, webinar. Uh, I believe everybody is able to uh, see the screen, uh, which is said as webinar on electric vehicle powertrain a webinar on vehicle simulation for powertrain sizing. Uh, if you are able to get it, so just drop me a text if it is yes. So uh, then if it is all good, let me go ahead and uh, you know, deliver it across to you. Um, anybody just can you please drop us a message? Okay, perfect. Maybe just a couple of people are wonderful. Yeah, it's perfect. Thanks a lot, guys, uh, for just dropping a text. So um, it's all good then. Let's go ahead and start it. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, me, I would be Suraj, uh, the course director, and I'm the founder and CEO of Decibels Lab, uh, who will be delivering the session. I've been working in uh, EV tech for close around four years, um, extensively in the powertrain uh, sizing and simulation. And even apart from it, we've been helping uh, a lot of startups and, uh, in India and abroad to, uh, to consult, uh, to help to develop their products. Uh, that's that's what Decibels has been doing it, and I've been having part of it Decibels, and and having a building a team in Decibels. Uh, so we worked extensively with uh, a lot of startups, and that gave us a very good amount of idea in terms of you know what we could uh, do using a simulation because the real time requirements which we have worked with. Apart from it, yeah, uh, we work in other areas. Let me go ahead and uh, introduce a bit about us. So before we start the session, so this would be the webinar flow, which I'm expecting to have. Uh, so uh, we would just take a couple of minutes to talk about decibels, so just this a bit of it, not too much into detail. And then we will understand about uh, a purpose of this course. That's basically all about you know, the modeling of a dynamic system like an EV. So how is it done and why it is so important? And then we'll jump into understanding why simulation exposure is important to anyone. Uh, to become an aspiring engineer in an AV segment. So this would be the overall uh, you know, webinar flow, what we're expecting to have, and uh, which would possibly land around 45 minutes to one hour, depending upon the interactions and QA sessions we're going to have. Right, so that's the whole plan of it. Uh, so in discussing about uh, decibels, uh, the first part, yeah, Decibels offer uh, learning solutions. Uh, that's a part of Decibels, uh, lms.decibelslab.com, which is learning management systems. So with our all expertise uh, in the industry side, we have built a lot of content. We have, we have done a lot of projects to various industries. So we wanted to put all of that into a learning scale. Uh, so that's when uh, uh, lms.decibelslab came into a picture. Uh, with completely sort of a hands-on uh, project-based uh, learning approach models and, and every step-by-step -step rather than uh, having a theory and, and there is no practicality behind it. So most of 90% of course content is more towards, you know, you learn it and you do it as a concept of it. So Decibels manage uh, lms.decibelslab.com, which is an e-learning portal. And apart from it, uh, Decibels also offer consulting services in the electric vehicle powertrain, uh, maybe in terms of simulation, maybe in terms of cell selection, maybe in terms of thermals of the battery pack, optimization of powertrains, and maybe optimization of transmissions and things like that. So uh, that's what we do and we help in new product development. And also we have a lot of consultants uh, in the areas of manufacturing uh, 
uh, we support a few of the areas of manufacturing too. And apart from it, in the third uh, area, we help in research and development uh, for the lab setups. So, so if any university uh, or college or industry want to uh, start an R&D center, so we support them by setting up uh, uh, labs uh, where they would be able to conduct uh, sort of experiments and uh, would be able to you know, take up all their uh, research ideas into reality. Uh, so that's what we do as uh, one area of it. Then on the other side, uh, decibels provide employment services. Uh, what employment services are meaning is, so we, when we train people, a lot of industry do require these trained uh, resources because as such today, you don't see uh, not majorly any college offers a master's in electric vehicle. As such today, to the content of uh, trained resources are also not available if college wants to start it. So as decibels has that you know, a leading edge on the side working with projects, so the moment we train them, this, the people who are trained have enough experience uh, to start a career in EV sector. So we provide employment services. We do directly, and apart from it, we have uh, tied up with a few partners. Uh, through them, we place the students on a contract employment or a permanent employment rules for startups and the OEMs across. So that's a bit about decibels. And uh, yes, very thanks for spending a couple of minutes listening to it. So getting ahead and starting to the, the major part of the, the session. Uh, so uh, here is all about why we want to model an EV, right? So uh, in understanding that, you know, why we have to model an EV, there are many reasons, uh, many, many reasons behind it. But I have put across a few of them today, and uh, out of which we can discuss only a few of them because it requires a large amount of time, possibly like a two to three years of experience to put across together and, and I explain it a bit in time. So I would not just go into everything so that you know I so nobody understands what, what everything is. So basically we should just touch base on a few of the topics and try to and understand what is the scope of uh, learning. Uh, so in considering that, uh, the first one to start out with the uh, time dependent system. So why we should do a modeling of an EV, that why just don't we do a, a hand calculations and then come up with, let's say this is a motor size, this is a battery size. It's a time dependent system. The meaning of time dependent system is, uh, the system is, uh, the parameters of the system are varying with respect to time. You take a velocity, it is varying with respect to time, right? You take uh, acceleration, it is changing because velocity is in relationship with respect to the, uh, acceleration is in respect to the velocity. Apart from it, the temperature of the system is changing. Maybe, you know, the thermals of the batteries are changing, the environmental temperature is changing, and, and maybe there are a lot of other parameters which, which keeps changing in terms of a traction motor efficiencies, in terms of inverter efficiencies. So when, when you want to put all of this system together in a hand calculation, it becomes humongously, humongously impo impossible to make it happen, right? That's, that's a bottleneck. Why can't we do just a hand calculations and then possibly you can try to, let's say, uh, 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 solve a couple of equations and come up with a solution. And when you do a hand calculation, it, it, would, it would also possibly require another set of efforts because if you want to reiterate everything, then you have to do the all calculations again back. But when we do a model-based approach to develop EVs, so it would be much more simpler. So that will help you to, to make the model uh, and then utilize the model for a multiple uh, times for uh, various reasons. If you wanna um, increase the weight of the vehicle, you can change the acceleration parameters, you would be able to do all of it. So that's, that's the very necessary part of it. It's a time dependent system and it's a dynamic system. So it, it, it becomes quite challenging to do things with a hand calculation. But on the other side, if you do a modeling, so it would help us to make things much faster. And then predict the component sizing. A uh, component sizing, we will discuss definitely about it uh, on the topic of time dependent system and uh, component sizing. And also a very bit of our one slide on optimization of components. And we would touch more, would not touch more on uh, predict, uh, predict the system and component behavior and uh, predict energy consumption and uh, predict life cycle analysis. So and, and in terms of uh, predicting the component sizing, so component sizing is not just a direct factor. You, you would have to run like you know iterations after iterations to kind of you know, confine to a, a conclude to a one. Uh, uh, I would say the, the motor size, or a, let's say the battery size, or let's say the inverter size, or possibly the sizing of your cooling systems and and things like that, right? So that is what we do. Once we have a, a model and we would subject the model with respect to various different drive cycles, with various, uh, various different you know, acceleration requirements, gradability requirements, and things like this. And then, then we will be able to optimize uh, size of a component with respect to the requirements. 
Um, so the going ahead, let's say in terms of optimization, which I could bring you some bit of an insights in optimization. So you, you would select a motor, but you want the motor to perform much of its efficiency regions. So if you want to do that, you need to ensure, okay, there's a transmission setting in behind. So that kind of, you know, is able to play a little bit of a, you know, a cushion for you so that, you know, you operate the motor on with the efficiencies. Or else possibly you go ahead and select a motor which, which tend to mostly operate in the best operating efficiencies whenever the vehicle is running into a place. So this is how you possibly like, you know, play around with the model and, and we'll be able to decide upon things. And predict the system behavior and components over the span of a time. Let's say you want to drive the vehicle for quite some time and see what really system behaves like. You could check it with the simulation models. And then predict the energy consumption. That's a very important thing, right? When you want to set up a system and you know ensure that electric vehicles are all about having lesser energy inside them. So you need to ensure how best you could optimally utilize the whole energy which is in the battery pack. So you could do that with the, the predicting an energy uh, consumption and then uh, the predicted life cycle analysis. Possibly you want to see, okay, how the battery pack would, you know, take, keep its energy because we have a SOH parameter, right? If you have participated in the uh, BMS webinar, I spoke about, spoke about SOH. It's a set of health which talks about uh, power fading and a capacity fading. So battery would die out uh, over a span with respect to its utilization. So now you want to see, maybe I, I sell a car or a bike to a customer and after one year, let's say if he drives for this much of duration or a length of uh, distance, so what would be the, the battery capacity? How much it can still store the energy? I'll take another consideration, if a customer drives the vehicle aggressively, so then what would be the, the life of the battery, which would be at its state? So like this, you could do a lot of this analysis and I'm, I'm just limiting myself to a few topics here, but, but there are a lot of other things also you could do in terms of a cell level, in terms of a, uh, maybe just on the motor, motor side of it and even the traction inverter side of it and other components. So this is what, uh, as, as majorly, which we supposed to discuss uh, for the, the current topic. And uh, going ahead, we should start with one by one. We should start with the time-dependent system. So yeah, in understanding the time-dependent system, uh, yes, EV is a time-dependent system. If you see it here, so there is a varying velocity, there's a varying acceleration, and the distance in, into a place. So uh, if you see there are drive cycles, which is an FTP 75 or WTB drive cycle, or if you take consideration like a race track, right? So simulation is required everywhere. If you're building a race car, if you're building a, a normal car, if you're just building a hobby car, so you have to optimize your components, which you're putting into the vehicle in a, in a perfect manner. So in, in understanding this one, if you see the, the drive cycle, which is like this, which is more transit course. So you accelerate the vehicle, you decelerate the vehicle, you accelerate the vehicle, you decelerate the vehicle. This would again put an abuse on the, uh, the motor and the motor has to pull the, uh, the current from the battery. So there's a, a huge amount of transit requirements in the whole system, right? So, and, and when you're, let's say, uh, if you're driving a race car, so uh, which, is, which will be more aggressively changing than this one because the moment you want to hit a corner, uh, you're, you're slowing up your pedal and then you're pressing the brakes and then the sudden the corner is over, all you want to do is just press the accelerator back so you can you know, shoot up your speed. So the, the, the velocity is continuously varying, the acceleration is also continuously varying. So moment all the systems are varying into a place, this is, uh, this is a requirement of the system. Basically the driver is wishing to reach the requirements, but is your battery, is the motor, is the transmission designed a way that to give out uh, a required amount of uh, you know, energy to the motor to drive it. So in, in terms of understanding, this is one of its parameters. So basically the, uh, the input to the system, that's the velocity of the vehicle is keeps on varying. That's why we, we say, yeah, one of the time dependency is basically the velocity and, and obviously the acceleration along with it and the, the distance of driving. Maybe if you consider as a driver, so you would possibly transit every day, let's say five kilometers and then you charge your vehicle. So, but, but if somebody else would drive for 10 kilometers and charge a vehicle, possibly somebody would drive like 25 kilometers and charge a vehicle. So all of this behavior will affect the battery life. So because of the charging way we do it, depending upon its SOC regions, there is different type of effects in the battery. So that's what we would be able to possibly put it across as let's say how time dependent system uh, the EV is. So why the, the modeling is required to implement all these things into a factor. And going on to the next slide, so where I would talk about, let's say uh, <clears throat> dependency in terms of uh, temperature. So first the cell is undergoing uh, uh, 
a reaction. So basically you have to, it, had a, it has to put out a current with respect to your driving requirements. Let's say you accelerate faster. So you're drawing a, drawing a current out of the motor controller. A motor controller is drawing out of the BMS and BMS is pulling it from the battery, right? So it is drawing a lot of current out of it. So again, the, the reactions are happening inside it. So if you, if you keep on accelerating and decelerating, there's a lot of transits between it. Or let's say if you're going peacefully at a specific uh, kilometers per hour, it is, it is drawing uh, a current at a specific rate. So moment this draw, we call it as, it is basically the reactions which is happening inside a cell. So if you're not too much of a current, obviously there is a lot of heat being generated in the battery. Not just the heat, that will lead to sort of, you know, uh, electrolyte decomposition and then a lot of other components going to go bad in the battery and that would cause, a, let's say, the gas formations and things like that. That's a cell chemistry point of it. But considering the heat is going to increase at the cell level, if you see on the right hand bottom corner of it. So the, then because it's a pack, right? So you have multiple number of cells together, or let's say uh, modules as such, uh, then the, the heat of the, the module is going to increase and, the, and the, the whole pack is going to increase. So when the temperature is varied at a pack level, the cell also behaves in a different way. So the meaning of it is, you take an example, if you have, if you have, if you have electric car and you're driving an electric car, if the temperature of the, that day is, let's say, 45 degrees Celsius, if you charge the vehicle fully from, let's say, it's 100 a person charged, you drive the vehicle, the vehicle will give you lesser mileage comparatively, depending upon, let's say, uh, even thermal management system is there for the battery pack. But still, the thermal management has to also run to keep the battery at its optimal temperature. So it would consume energy. So you would definitely get a less range. Let's say you're getting 100 kilometers every day at a 25 degrees Celsius uh, atmospheric temperature. You would possibly get, let's say, 90 kilometers with a 100% SOC, which you have charged with. So a system is behaving in a different way with respect to a temperature, uh, which, is, which is getting changed at the cell level, at the pack level, right? So that's why we could call the system as uh, time dependent, uh, sorry, temperature dependent, and there's an influence of temperature. The influence starts with a cell, let's say at a pack, and then it goes to the environment too. And you take considerations of hotter cities in, 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 uh, in India. So you, you go up north or possibly even in, in cities like Chennai uh, or even Mangalore and places like that, where let's say the temp day, day temperature itself is uh, 40 degrees Celsius. So the the optimal the atmospheric temperature is 40, 40 degrees Celsius. So obviously the, the pack will be little more than that, right? Optimally without even using it. And you start driving around the city, obviously you're discharging the, the battery. It would definitely increase the temperature of the battery. So then, but it says that, okay, it, it, the cell operates best at specific regions of its temperature. So the moment it goes out of it, the chemical reactions happen in a different way, right? Because the cell is a highly nonlinear system. It's a chemistry which is happening inside it. So maybe there's a small graph, which I have explained in the BMS uh, the, uh, webinar uh, uh, two days back, which talked about how the cell will behave uh, differently with respect to different temperatures. You take a cell and, and subject the cell at 25 degrees Celsius and you discharge it, it exhibits a different curve. And if you subject the same cell at, let's say, 30 degrees Celsius, it exhibits a different curve, right? So and now, how do we implement all these things at hand calculation? So it is not possible to do all of these. There's so many parameters put into together. And this system will not behave in the same way because the temperature will not be the same always. The temperature will be keep on varying depending upon, let's say, your driving conditions, uh, atmosphere, and all these things. So, so you have to put all this together at our model to predict the model in the right way. So there, this is something as a graph, which is there, uh, you know, uh, uh, found uh, with, with a couple of research papers at different race tracks. Okay, how, how is the, the cell temperature uh, is being increased? Uh, let's say this is at uh, Baharun uh, FN track and, and uh, different other tracks into a place. So, so the overall objective of the slide is to understand that, okay, temperature affects uh, 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 vehicles uh, power frame sizing. It, it also affects the, the, the life, the range of the vehicle which you get when you drive the vehicle, right? So it is an important parameter to also include as a part of the model. And uh, that's why you say it's part of the, the dependency. And going ahead to the next slide. Um, so there is another dependency, something like in the motor efficiency influence. 
So the motor efficiency, let's say you, when you buy a motor, if you're, let's say, a guy who's going to manufacture an EV, or let's say you're a student team who's going to buy a motor. So you would buy a motor and you tell that, okay, this, uh, this is how the motor works at different regions, right? So one is um, directly selecting a motor from the market also requires an insights because you should know uh, what is my wheel size, what is the transmission size, what is the transmission gear ratios, and what is actually the RPM of the, the motor I'm going to run at. Because you're consuming uh, energy and on, you're converting the chemical energy at the battery into a mechanical energy at the motor. So if the motor itself is operating at a bad efficiency regions, you're consuming a lot of energy out of it, right? And again, inside the motor, so the efficiency depends on the time, temperature. Because it is not only the torque with respect to RPM, you should be able to plot uh, efficiency graphs, but efficiency also depends on the temperature. If you, when you're using, uh, when the motor is running, the temperature is keep on increasing. So depending upon the temperature, the, the, the motor is you know, uh, uh, operating at a different uh, regions of its efficiency. So now if you have selected a motor, uh, maybe you have sized the motor for a specific requirement, you also need to size it to ensure that, okay, regions of its operations are known and, and that motor op always operated the best efficiency, right? And on the other side of it, you also need to consider, okay, how much is the heat being generated in the motor? And with respect to that heat, what's the change in the efficiencies? So you also have to include that kind of a system uh, that you could be able to predict exactly about, let's say, amount of energy consumption, let's say, per kilometer, if you want to predict it. Right, so if you want to optimally design an electric vehicle, because it's it's all about optimal today. Everybody has put the batteries, you know, they're able to bring in fuel cells from manufacturers like Samsung, LG, Panasonic, are all A123 and things like that. But but the innovation is at a side where if you see Tesla, they have the the best uh, overall efficiency. If you drive a Tesla for one kilometer, the amount of energy it consumes. If you drive another vehicle, uh, EV, so amount of energy it consumes is have have a difference it they consume more than what tesla consumes so that is where they have done the best of the powertrain design optimal optimizing the components and things like that so that is what it requires simulation to be involved and uh, i think i skipped a small part of the discussions here uh, let me just go back and put you a few more insights into your temperature here so if you consider there is some point which i mentioned here like a bev and the hybrids so BEV is battery electric vehicles, which are only driven with the battery as a power source. So hybrids, as you would know, right? So XCVs, they call it as, and all these things, like plug-in hybrids, mild hybrids, micro hybrids, all these type of hybrids and range extended hybrids and things like that. So the cell, which is used in hybrids, undergo a very high discharge. It, it goes over like 2C, 3C, 4C. It means it is undergoing a tremendous amount of you know, current being discharged out of it. So that would produce higher amount of current, temperature definitely, right? Because it is operated at a high, uh, high discharges. So on the electric vehicle side, we operated a, a let's say lesser seas. So it, it is a little better on the side. So knowing all these things, a house system is uh, independently behaving or let's say uh, differently behaving at, at various uh, applications such as uh, battery electric vehicles and on the hybrid side of it. So we talked about uh, influence of uh, the motor efficiency. Uh, and then on the other side, there is an inverter. So inverter is basically the motor controller, the traction inverter. So uh, you have a motor, which is let's say BLDC motor, which works as an AC motor. So then you have a battery. So, so the battery is DC, but the motor is AC. So you need to convert that the, the, the DC to AC, right? So one of the, the major functionality of the inverter is to convert uh, the DC to AC, and second thing is obviously the, the switch the, uh, uh, the the poles in the the motor that the motor runs with respect to controlling, let's say, the RPM of the motor, and also in terms of controlling the the torque of the motor, and it does a lot of other functionalities along with it, and many other functionalities. Maybe we could discuss another topic when we take about the motor controllers. So, but again, the efficiency of this traction inverter is 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 varied with respect to different regions. In terms of the temperature, there's a dependency. In terms of the amount of current it is operating, there's a dependency. The, the, the RPM it is switching the, the motor, there is an efficiency for that. So this is also contributing uh, to a whole system in, in terms of losses. And the second thing is it is also varying with respect to time, right? Because there is a temperature dependency and other things inside the traction motor too. So now if you kind of get everything, uh, you know, sort of what we're discussing here, 
you would you would have got a broader scope of of why simulation is required you know why so many engineers are are working in and doing the simulations because system is so complex right it is not just like okay uh, you buy a motor you buy one controller put everything together and let's say the electrical is running so that is just the starting point of it but if you see it towards the industry scope they're talking even let's say even 10 watts of energy uh, even 5 watts of energy being accounted and if you go to a controller level they are just talking even dead lesser than that right so it, it's required to analyze the system to that level so if you want to do uh, a system analysis of that level then you would definitely have to uh, use simulation tools and to, to get deeper insights on how you could size the components. So going ahead, uh, this is something which, uh, like you know, Decibel teaches. Uh, we teach in the courses uh, for all the, the participants uh, who attend. So they would be able to build a whole electric vehicle model in a tools like Scilab XCOS, and we also teach Scilab XCOS for one day and another day continuation of the modeling. So if you see down here, maybe this itself requires, let's say, two hours of discussion to derive on all these graphs and you know how, how they're behaving. But yeah, like, like an engineer seeing an EV, but a, a layman seeing an EV is totally different, right? So a, a simulation guy who, who looks at a vehicle, it's like, okay, what, what is its acceleration? Let's say, okay, what, what would be the transmission ratios, its efficiencies? What is its motor operating regions? What possible the motor torque is? Is it in a nominal, is it in a peak? What would be the amount of current drawn from it? Okay, what would be the sizing of the battery? And what would be the packaging sizes of the modules into a place? And that's how we discuss on the side of, okay, uh, uh, simulation set of uh, PV basically. So this is how it looks as day-to-day -day life. It's all the graphs, you know, it, it's all the set of graphs uh, put together. And, and that's how uh, I see uh, an EV when I'm a simulation engineer which sort of uh, gives me very deeper insights on, on looking at it and let's say, okay, this is how I select a component, this is how I optimally put a component together. So until here, uh, to the last slide, so, sorry. Yeah, we have uh, understood about uh, a time dependency of a system uh, and also the dynamic behavior of the system. So this, this all the above slides put across together, if, if you have got it. So that is what we say uh, in terms of a, a, a Time dependent dynamic system, right? So, when any system is time dependent and it is dynamic, so we have to go for a, a, a simulation modeling. And that's how much of time a company would spend. And, and to do even before this, you should have all the data. Let's say you should have a cell data, you should have a motor test data, you should have all the other components data to do uh, all the simulations into our place. So, and, and if you change, just change a single cell, and let's say you want to you upgrade to a new set of cells supplied by Samsung boom, you have to do everything all into a game uh, to, to simulate, right? Because you're just not selling it for two vehicles. You're selling it, let's say, a uh, few thousand vehicles and you get a customer complaint and your brand goes bad. And, and because it's, it's just a big thing, today newspaper covers you up, okay, this, this vehicle is not giving you right mileage as it is promised in uh, catalog, right? But engineers, let's say companies cannot take that kind of a blame or a risk uh, in, in, in accepting it. So when, when it is happening that way, they're very serious about you know, what they want to put inside the vehicle. And to understand that, they have to, they have to do very much of analysis and, and the only simulation tools can you know, help you to do that, right? So yeah, that's, that's a bit of insights which I can have, but I'm very sure what I'm discussing here is at a very basic level. So you could go in deeper on each components of it and study how is it done. So that itself is a very large topic into a place. So uh, yeah, putting it all into a place, let, let's take a few questions here and uh, the few questions. Um, then we could jump to the next slide. That is, let's say the predictive component sizing. Uh, the estimate value is all in real time or is it from a simulation based output? Uh, so, uh, yeah, thanks for asking the question. It's a good, very good question. Uh, to answer the question, we would always have a relative uh, comparison uh, to the simulation model and the real-time data. So, real-time data can only prove you when you have a hardware and, and test that hardware into a place. So, all the simulation data would, would let's say, the graphs coming out and, let's say, the information coming out of the simulation modules would be very close to, let's say, 90 to 95% uh, equivalences depending upon what kind of data you have to give that model, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, let's say all the constants you're defining and let's say the characteristics of the motor efficiencies you're defining, if you're defining all of them correctly, you would definitely have a model which is very accurate. And, and from here, you could, you could continue your next journey to, let's say, software in the loop. This is starting from model in the loop and then you jump into software in the loop and then once it is done, you would jump into, let's say, uh, the hardware in the loop and once the hardware in the loop is done, then you would jump into your uh, real-time uh, vehicle testing. So this is, I would say, the beginning point of it. And then it's an iteration, you know, you keep on correcting between your, uh, all the life cycle. It's not like, okay, simulation is done and everything is right. So you would, you would put it to SIL testing, then you would go for your, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, the, the hardware in the loop testing and then, then the real-time testing. So uh, Lohit, um, yeah, uh, Chinmay, good evening. Uh, so Lohit, I have a question. Do you consider electrical components such as light and horn that are used? Uh, yeah, a very valid question, Lohit. Absolutely. Uh, any of the auxiliary systems, sort of a parasite. So we should have to consider, okay. So because in, in uh, electric vehicle, you have to supply the energy from uh, the high voltage battery. Let's say it's a 48 volt battery pack. Right, so let's not call it as 48 as high volt because 60 is high volt actually. So um, any any battery above, six, let's say 48 volt or anything, you have a higher voltage. So you need to first of all step down this voltage into 12 volt. That's the first thing. So you have a DC DC converter in the electric vehicle. So then again, the DC DC converter has energy efficiency losses. You should consider them. And also, let's say there is an auxiliary battery. We need to recharge this auxiliary battery. We have to consider that. And there is a consumption of all the system. Let's say your audio and music and uh, anything else, uh, for example, headlights, uh, even air conditioning systems, because it all runs on a, the battery power, right? So we should definitely have to consider all of that in, in simulating it. So if you are a sort of engineer who have knowledge about all these things, what you do, you know, okay, an average consumption of the requirement. So you would put it as a constant, or let's say you, you put a gain block and you multiply a specific value, because you know, okay, this is sort of, okay, uh, this is how much would be the requirement, right? So that is sort of thing which comes with the uh, you know uh, experience and, and industries they know okay because they've been working on electrical system for let's say last like 100 years so they have some factor to be multiplied with so that's about an answer Lohit. i believe i answered your question yeah we should consider uh, definitely but yeah depending upon sort of exposure you would have you would just multiply with a specific factor to consider it the him i hope you answered your question uh, if the estimation values is all real time or is it a simulation based so what I showed you is a is, uh, few are tested and got, and a few are simulated values. Okay, so then, yeah. do you use GT suit software? Uh, no, we have not used GT suit software. Uh, extensively, we are using, uh, let's say, um, a Scilab, which is uh, pretty much an open source uh, tool. And uh, we also recently got uh, a partner with another company, so where we will be also using uh, uh, MATLAB extensively and uh, for the, the feature requirements and that's what majorly been considered. There are a few more tools uh, that are also been used to do our simulations. They're sort of a plug and play, you, know, you can just put a value and you know, get some results into a place. But yeah, MATLAB is extensively used and on the Scilab side, it's something similar. If you do not have a license and you can use Scilab or GNU Octave is there, you can use and, um, and MATLAB is something really good and fantastic. We just have to pay money for it, that's it. So yeah, there is one more question from Akash. Um, okay, uh, I may take a few questions here at the last, I'll take the rest of the questions, guys. So what is it that, what type of simulation is being taken here? I mean, in software simulation or a mechanical simulation? Um, Akash, it, it, this is a software model-based simulation. So where we're predicting uh, about, uh, let's say the energy consumption, losses and everything which is happening in the system. So you're not doing anything mechanical. Let's say, okay, whether the motor can withstand the mechanical load of 100 Newton meter, we're not doing it. And, uh, but we are considering if it has operated at 100 Newton meter, what would be the efficiencies, right? And uh, in terms of battery, we're not considering, okay, how I can cool the battery, right? But I'm considering how much of heat is being generated in the battery. So that's what we are trying to do with here. And, uh, guys, could you please mute? Uh, if in case somebody has unmuted. Yeah, so um, cool. Uh, next, go ahead. Is it the software simulation? Okay. 
Perfect. Uh, how can we learn simulate like this? Okay, I will come back with an answer to you. Yes, we'll definitely able to help you uh, in, in making the understandings and learning also. Wow, that's fantastic. So a lot of questions, wonderful. That, that's what we require. You know, we need to think, that's what we say, uh, uh, simulation engineer is all about analyzing the data and questions are the very key to understand these things. So uh, I would come back and answer to you guys. Uh, um, Lohit and uh, somebody from Dell and let's say Siddhi and Vinay. So we'd answer to you back, okay? So just we'll get, get back to the session or else the session get delayed too much, right? So yeah, in, in going ahead, we would just jump into the, the, the predict the component sizing. But I believe you all just got an idea about what is time dependency of a system. And yeah, there's that's, that's a lot about the complexity of a system interface. And yeah, so <laughs> seriously, yeah, it's it's time dependency. Okay, so so it, it's a lot, and it's really a lot, and, and and that kind of puts you as an engineer to think so much about it. So yeah, uh, let's jump into understanding a component sizing, and uh, we can talk about a motor sizing. So we see here that you know from the simulation data, we are feeding uh, vehicle velocity uh, in terms of a drive cycle. We call it as so if you're, if you're doing a race vehicle, you would do a racetrack data. If you are doing a, a vehicle which is sold to a general market, government gives you these drive cycles, like NADC, that the one uh, FTP 75 or UDS 06. Depending upon the specific country, they have different drive cycles. We will use it and we will give the model input as the drive cycles. And then we would continue our journey ahead. And then that's what we get as a graph here. And here, this graph on, on this side, which is here, kind of pull out some details and try to maybe I'm just trying to draw it things here so that you know you could you could get it what I'm trying to tell yeah so the thing which is discussing here right this is a uh, the wheel torque and we're trying to predict and let's say this is the the wheel I'm really sorry so I put the same graphs um, no worries, I would, I would just put it across this way and maybe change it later for you. I would be able to share this presentation, so no worries at all. So you could, you could just refer it back. So I was about to put the more talk here, so it just got replaced with the wheel talk. So uh, talking about those discussions here, so if you see this graph, which is, let's say, the motor talk as a part of it. So what motor talk tells you is, okay, this is the talk demand by the motor. And uh, if you see this regions here, So uh, the wheel torque, which is right here, there's a value called zero, and then there's a requirement till let's say the 40 and up to 50 Newton meter. And if you see, there's a negative torque also, right? What would be the negative torque if you can predict? It's a deceleration torque when you're decelerating a vehicle, right? So it, because if you're breaking your vehicle or you're slowing down the vehicle, so that's a negative torque basically. So that's what which you see in this graph. So now what wheel is demanding? If I want to achieve the specific velocity, So if I want to achieve a specific velocity, so it is demanding uh, a specific amount of, uh, uh, I would say the, the torque, right? So if you could see it here, one second, a bit of a problem here. So, yeah. So if you see this line as a part of it, so this is what it is telling you, okay, this is a region where I'm operating the motor very largely. And then I am operating a motor at, uh, let's say, in these conditions, a little lesser. Okay. So this is in terms of a, a wheel torque. So if you're using a, a hub motor, take an example, right? So you're not using a transmission. So basically, whatever the wheel is demanding, you have to supply just using the, the motor cap capabilities. So hub motor is the challenge. Basically, you all the torque demanded by the motor has to be supplied by the, uh, the hub motor itself. So then if you have a motor which is outside of the hub, let's say a non-hub motor, then you could use a transmission, right? So you have seen the eight bike motors and things like that. So they have used an, a transmission in between so that you know, they can optimally size the, the motor interruptions. So that, that's, that's how you would be able to play around if you have a transmission in between the, the uh, motor and a wheel. If you're using a hub motor, all these requirements has to be met by uh, motor itself. So that becomes very quite of a challenge. And that, is, that, is, that would be a difficulty for the motor all alone to you know, give out uh, uh, enormous amount of torque. 
and the motor has to be very big and bulky and again that leads to let's say uh, uh, ride handling situations maybe suspension when the, there is a load on the uh, suspension if you hit a bump uh, it would vibrate let's say it, it would take more time to settle down because the mass is more in the suspensions right uh, so this would be some some point which you could take it here so i would have driven more details if i had a graphs for the uh, the motor but but as point of it yeah so a motor would have uh, a graph which looks like this let's say if i could draw it across to you uh, in a simple manner if we consider a motor and uh, the motor would draw with uh, graphs like this so this would be a nominal torque and this would be a peak torque so you you would be able to decide okay what should be the motor size depending upon having a graph like this so how do you decide so if if you are to up, if you operate a motor always below nominal torque so it is good for the motor but you can also use uh, and go to a peak torque in few 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 seconds for a while okay but how do you tell how much time my vehicle is operating the motor is operating in a, the peak torque or it's only operating in the nominal torque regions right so that I should be able to do if I use a, a, a graph like this, right? So if I use a model like this, where I'll be able to predict, let's say in this region and in all this region, so I'm operating at a nominal torque. So I know it's a wheel torque graph, but yeah, understanding it side of it, but if it's a hub motor, possibly you would have to supply all this torque by a wheel itself, right? So on the other side, if you consider sorry my cursor is just going everywhere across i'm not able to see it yeah so if you see in this region where the motor is actually operating in the peak region okay peak torque so you would know okay i can subject the motor if this is a hub motor which i'm selecting possibly i'll select a motor which would give me a nominal torque let's say somewhere around uh, 25 newton meter right a uh, 30 newton meter so that motor is always operating within its nominal torque and so it is not going uh, let's say too much into the peak torque regions but yeah it is going to the peak torque regions only for the few seconds so the, by this way you would be able to ensure that the motor is not operated in a peak torque always and uh, so that you can you can save the life of the motor so this is a bit of the analysis which i could just bring it to you uh, with some insights cool um apologies i'm not sure why i'm not able to see the figures on the screen yeah and uh, going ahead to the next thing uh, in terms of a battery sizing um, so we have different data okay so we have a data from here which says about let's say uh, the the motor part of it motor power is is being given here so we know the wheel speed and we know the you know um, the rpm and then we would we can calculate okay what would be the requirement of a motor because uh, if you have a transmission if you do not have a transmission it's like power is equal to 2.0 by 60, right? So you know the P and you know the, the RPM, so N, and you should be able to calculate the, uh, the torque. And the other side, you should be able to also, you should know the torque and you'll be able to calculate the power. So this is how the motor power demands. But if you see here, this is the battery power, right? The motor demands, let's say, if you, if you see a graphs very detailedly and very carefully, you would be able to observe uh, some of the, the regions very clearly. Uh, so maybe let's say in this region, uh, the motor is operating somewhere around 2000, right? But if you see it here, it is going up to 2500. Okay. The question here is the motor power requirement is 2000, but why does the battery is giving 2500, right? So the why it would be is because the motor have certain losses. The other side, after the motor, we have traction inverter. That's our motor controller, right? And the other components also. So putting it all these things together, so we should also consider the losses inside that the, the traction inverter also. By considering that the battery is giving out uh, uh, more than what motor requires because there are losses in the system, like a traction inverter and also in the, the motor point of it. So like this is all we should be able to put into the model and then we'll be able to analyze, okay, how this is, things are going on. You could put a 3D graph of the motor with respect to torque, with respect to RPM, with respect to temperature, how the efficiencies are varying, and the model will be able to predict you, okay, if the motor is continuously changing its RPM, but going to, it will go to all these RPMs and will be able to tell you, okay, you are operating in these regions and this is how much the efficiencies are, right? And now let's say go back to the, the current point of it. 
see, I, if I take a session, possibly each graph, we would talk around, let's say, 10 to 20 minutes uh, or even 30 minutes. And then we can take a one project and really execute the whole vehicle model. And we should be able to make a lot of decisions out of it. But right now, as a part of it, maybe I, I hope you can understand to a certain level. But if not, okay, I want you to understand what is actually requirement in the industry is how people are doing it, right? So, it's, uh, so then the battery current side of it, if you see the regions here, okay, battery is operating, let's say, close around 30 amps below. And it is also going to some higher current regions, which is somewhere around, let's say, 55, uh, 55 amps and things like that. This is actually the model of Aether uh, 450 bike. We have built it and we have put all the battery size and motor, motor size, all the components specifically to Aether, uh, Aether 450 bike. So most of the, the predictions are coming closer, okay? So if you see here on the, the C-reading of the battery, which gives you a more detailed understanding that how, what is the C-reading I'm operating my battery under? Possibly you're operating your battery somewhere below, let's say 0 0.6, and uh, you're operating also the battery above, let's say 1C. Uh, it's a discharge current of the battery, right? And this side, so you're operating, let's say around 30 amps, uh, usually nominal, and you're going up to, let's say, peak of uh, 60, 55, 60 amps. What exactly these graphs tell you? Um, many different things. If you have too much of high, high current discharges, obviously the battery has to put out a lot of energy and then it, it would heat up. A lot of chemical reaction, then it would heat up. Then you would need a cooling system, right? On the other side, if you keep accelerating, decelerating, accelerating, decelerating, it a transit current requirements, then it affects actually the life of the battery, okay? So maybe if you consider motorsports, you, you won't be able to use those engines or motors like you know for a lifetime, right? They're, they're designed to use for a very specific uh, time span for a couple of uh, racetracks, and then you just skip them and you know, put the new set of them. But for a real application, it is not like that. So if you have to also understand uh, the the life of the battery, if you buy an electric bike, also depends on the way you drive it. If you're a guy who is driving like, you know, uh, zoom, zoom, let's say too fast and then accelerating and then decelerating quite often and trying to do racing with somebody always, and you're trying to do a fast charging, definitely the battery will not come same as another person who is using, uh, uh, it, it's very casually, let's say he's not like doing it too much of accelerations, he's going in a slow phase and things like that. Maybe let's say your, your grandfather driving a vehicle and you know, a young guy driving a vehicle, right? So all these parameters put into a place will affect the life of the battery. We would be able to predict, but right now with this slide, we're talking about a sizing of the battery. By knowing the motor power, we could predict the battery power. By having a battery power, we also can calculate the battery current and uh, the battery C rating. The C rating will give us a cell selection. Okay, what should be the optimal cell I should select? According to this one, I should select a cell, okay, uh, somewhere, let's say, a uh, nominal of like, up to uh, 1.5 C. Uh, it's discharge capability so that I can still keep my cell under its behaviors, right? And the battery current tells you, okay, what would be the transit requirement or the system current, uh, or maximum amount of current uh, the, the motor is going to draw at, at all the different conditions into a place. So that's uh, a bit of insight. So it's giving you uh, the battery current. It's also giving you the serial of the battery. Um, so going ahead to the rest of the parts, we would move into the next slide. So, yep. So, in terms of optimization, this would be the, uh, the I would say the last slide to explain about uh, components. But yeah, we would we can drive more details uh, further ahead. Um, optimization tells you, okay, you have all the data, you have done the graphs, uh, uh, then you have some information tells you, okay, this is how it's behaving. But the next is, okay, how I put my system in a very very proper way that it, it, it is optimized to its best. Let's say in terms of uh, uh, ensuring that the motor always kept it in its own sweet points of efficiency and ensuring the, the temperature of the motor by knowing that, okay, when, when, what temperature would keep the motor best and knowing that, okay, the battery optimally, uh, how, what discharge ratings are good for the battery and what temperature is good for the battery and how do I ensure the thermals of the battery that you know you could circulate the, the let's say the right coolants and, and right let's say even say air cooling systems into a place. So this is where it comes in terms of optimizing it and also considering let's say regenerative energy, right? You would could generate a lot of regenerative energy that could actually save the battery, right? I, that could actually give more mileage to the customer uh, when he drives the vehicle. But but the problem is 
the regenerative energy can be so high that the battery won't be able to get recharged, right? So we will be able to optimize by, by knowing information to one level is right, and modeling is one level, and getting the graph is another level, deciding few things is to the next, and the next is about optimizing these components so that you're, you're getting best out of it, you're juicing out uh, to the, the best of best of its all the, the component systems, right? So, so that is what optimization talks about, where you could say, okay, uh, if you see here, this is a UDS cycle, uh, uh, UD, UD06, US06, I'm sorry. So we're trying to see, okay, where the motor is operating uh, in, in terms of its efficiencies. And this is what the graph about RPM. I'm putting the graph here, and, and this is how the regions of operation. So if, when it is a motor, it is operating like this. In the other side of it, can anybody guess what is in the bottom side and what is the representation in the bottom side? Let me take a few questions here so that you, know, you guys can just possibly can answer something here, right? What, what do you see? Okay, there's an upside is the motor side, right? What, what is the bottom side? What is this graph side in the bottom side? Can anybody just put across any questions, answers here? Okay. Region. Maybe, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a word which is very specific, right? Forward braking, very close. That's still not right, not a right answer. Back torque, yeah, that's the answer, right? It's it's a generator efficiency. So the motor is acting as a generator in the bottom. Perfect, guys. Yeah, uh, kudos to Ganesh and uh, uh, other guys who gave an answer. So this is this is actually the motor is acting as a generator in the bottom region. Okay, because when you're decelerating, you you basically call it a region. I understand, but actually in that region, the motor is acting as a generator. So it is it means that it is producing an energy. Right, and putting that energy back into the, the, the uh, batteries. So now, if, if you get this point of it, so what we're trying to do is, we, we're also trying to see, okay, what is the efficiency of when the motor acts as a generator, and see how much we can actually capture energy into the uh, uh, a battery. And we can also see and go deeper and, and, and learning about, okay, what would be the maximum regenerative current? What would be the maximum regenerative power, right? If the maximum regenerative current is too high, your battery is not designed to take that high currents, right? So then, then maybe your cell selection is wrong. Or maybe on the other side, I would say, okay, it was not required for you. So it may have been a cost challenging to get a cell which is too much of a high, high you know, uh, fast charging cells and things like that, right? So, I mean, it is just like, like vast topic to discuss, but yeah, as, as keeping it quite simple. A wonderful guys, and thanks very much for answering. And if you see this side here, we are able to see, okay, um, total energy is this, but actually what we require is this, which is in the red color, but what we gonna keep it as this, the reason being there is a regenerative energy which is being designed, which is being you know, produced by a vehicle itself when it is breaking, right? So if you can put both of them together, you can see optimally how you could reduce the total energy consumption, correct? So, so this is what we say, getting into the finer tones of it, getting into the very details of it and put a system right in place that, you know, we can, we can, we can make the system to function always at its best and sweet point, sweet points. Uh, and juice are the best of uh, what we can, you know, uh, get from all the system into our place. And that's what we do as, as engineering and optimization. So any questions across, uh, I should be able to take a couple of minutes here. Then I think yeah, as I delivered a few sections of it, we would limit ourselves into here because it, it, it would go deeper in, in understanding any of the further systems. So having not seen any text here, we could take those questions which we left, left uh, at the last. So, so where do we learn all these things? So you could learn all these things with decibels. Uh, decibels provides you the courses uh, on, on uh, simulation and modeling. So there is an upcoming session, which is planned on uh, 2nd May and a 3rd May. It's a two day, a com com complete day session. So you should be there with your laptops from morning to evening. And uh, there is more than like you know, a lot of people you have trained and, and amazing amount of feedback we have got. Even people from Tata Motors, Force Motors, uh, Continental, they have participated in their sessions. They were able to go out with very deep insights and understanding how the system behaves, okay? These are all the graphs which I'm giving you to you here. It is all done by uh, interns, like the students who learned. They have submitted their uh, uh, reports, and out of these reports, only I've you know drafted you some uh, images here. 
So if you want to learn, yeah, definitely we can help you. you I can text you the, the link where it is available. Uh, so from our site, maybe you should, you can just go out and check it out, check the courses and that would possibly help you to learn about uh, EVs in, in very detail. So maybe if you can just drop your text here. So this is a text. And um, yeah, so uh, you can just visit lms.deciblesLab.com and uh, that would, uh, you know, uh, give, give you more other courses also that are you know, offering in, in the sections of EVs. And the best of it is uh, most of our courses are much affordable for anyone. Uh, we don't charge too much uh, for the kind of pricing anybody would, would charge it for you uh, to teach this depth knowledge and this in detail analysis of the systems into our place. So, and we have 10 coupons. Uh, so you could apply DECI, it's a DECI electric vehicle simulation, DECI EV sim. So if you apply it, so you'd get a 30% discount and there are only 10 coupons. So if you're looking forward to participate, you could just hit onto the website and you know, you should be able to uh, register yourself on other courses. Okay. And there are other courses also, if you're very seriously planning to make a career in EV, and if you are a graduate and if you are about to graduate and if you're seriously looking for a career in EV, so Decibels has a few courses, which are master classes, which I could share it across to you in the email and which is not everybody can join also. If you're very seriously looking to get a job and we only take 30 people for a batch and um, it's basically six months long, almost three months you have to learn and you have to take a project. So that will be equivalent. We promise that you will be equivalent to a one year experienced engineer if you undergo the, the course uh, with us. So yeah, pretty much putting it across the stop at that point. So yeah, you could take up the course where you'll be able to learn everything in, de in detail and in depth uh, to make decisions uh, uh, on the EV simulation point of it. Cool. Um, if you're very serious about career, yeah, you could take up a master class, which, which is close around three months plus another three months of a project where actually you do a, a project with us and, and that would be a major project where you'll be able to implement what, what are the other things which I told you about and, and make a very advanced model. So yeah, let's take a few questions here and uh, where we start. Um, okay. What are the softwares uh, rather than MATLAB and the Scilab? Uh, okay, uh, Nilay, there are a few softwares like Ignite and there are some softwares like Cosmo. Uh, there is some software um, developed by a few other people. You could use it, but extensively, this this MATLAB and Scilab, which we have been using from our side. Do Scilab have all the required toolboxes for design? Lohit, uh, yeah, it is having limitations because it's a free software and uh, it is having some limitations. But yeah, for you to learn to start with, it is very simple, and you know, it, it is just like 200 MB file which executes on your computer than having you know, you have need a very high computing computers. You, you could just go ahead and start with Scilab. And see, it's, it's pretty simple and straightforward. If you know Scilab, you could just learn MATLAB in, in like this. And, and that's not a big challenge at all. And because, you know, a lot of people will, will, will have a challenge to download, let's say, 15, 20, you know, 15 to 80 GB of files and then a put it to the computer and they may not have a good computing powers. Scilab does a very honest job. Uh, but yeah, we do also teach using MATLAB if it is a master course. So yeah, after obtaining uh, the next question from the name called Dell, after obtaining the efficiency contour of motor, what changes should be should should made to optimize the power train? Um, see, I, what regions of operation? Okay, you can optimize your transmission and and okay, let the motor to operate with with required uh, RPMs into place, and also optimizing its torque torque regions. And then, then also optimizing temperature. You would know, okay, if you're, consume, if you're operating at this uh, torque and RPM, you can expect this much of heat to be generated. So you could optimize the temperature of, of by running your thermal systems and things like that. That's what you could do possibly by optimizing uh, uh, contours of uh, efficiency plots. Uh, there's a question from Siddhi. So um, currently there are Kalman filters and AI used to predict SOC. According to you, which is better? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's not something I would say a, a core specialization, which I have in, in SOC estimations, but yeah, it, it is, it is, I don't know, AI is something still really, I know, a sort of a fit right now uh, to automotive because you have certain compliances, which you have to comply for. I mean, as there is a compliance like um, ISO 26262, uh, functional safety standards, and also you have something like, uh, 
uh, Asin, uh, uh, and also you have something like uh, Autospice uh, and uh, Autosar and, and a few other compliances. So I'm not sure really they would let you to put an AI sort of a thing right now into BMS. I'm not really sure. Maybe you could, you could check it out. But yeah, maybe I, I would answer you to back question. You could just write as a text. Uh, one of my software engineer from BMS team possibly would be able to uh, you know answer to your question. Uh, so please give a brief about talk characteristics for BLDC motor. Okay, when I maybe it, it would be sort of a very different discussion. Maybe we could talk some other time. I could you could drop us a text and maybe I'll do I'll drop my email address. You could you could discuss further for that. So cool. Um, Ayush has some questions. Um, what does the slide on the right side to correlate to optimize slide? Okay. I believe I might have explained. Okay, the, I, we discussed on this about uh, um, regenerative energy. Yeah, uh, Parth, there's a question from Parth. Um, okay, so should we design a battery pack considering the peak voltage of cells or nominal voltage of cells because cells span majorly the SOC range in nominal voltage? So you could consider with respect to nominal, all the calculations part should be done with respect to nominal calculations. Again, in that you you will have like you know reduction in the voltage because the voltage will drop with respect to the SOC. Um, so you would have to also consider that. But right now, if you're trying to model for the first time, just keep voltage sort of a constant, and uh, you could you could run the model. Okay, and that would be the first level to try. So, will you share registration details for the course via email? Uh, yeah, we can definitely do that. Uh, else, what I'll do, I can also share it to you right here uh, for everybody. This is the course which is available for you. You could, you could be able to take, take it. So, uh, I mean, electrical third year in the simulation course is beneficial for us. So, simulation is 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 a fundamental for future. Even though I would have more time, I would have spoken to you a lot about it because I spent almost one hour by now. I'm not sure everybody would like to you know uh, listen because because it's I don't know what plans they have. So, you know, if, if you're an electrical engineer, let's say you're, you're working on a uh, uh, motor controller design, you're working on a, let's say the motor design, right? It is very, very necessary for you to know at a system level what is happening, right? You would be able to make a quicker decisions when you know a system as a behavior than just a component as such. But it doesn't limit you to just understand a, a component, but also it gives you a very detailed understanding on how else you can model your motor also. How else you can you can model your uh, traction control in super place? So so I would say if you ask me seriously, every college should have a simulation extensively, not just surfacing our some you know basic codes and putting up something in connections of blocks. But literally, it is definitely you know uh, required uh, you to have a knowledge. But what this course gives you is very specific to automotive and modeling. But if you learn about modeling, you can apply that skill anywhere else uh, for any other system. You can model anything as such in, in using equations of physics and mathematics. I believe yeah, I answered your question, Rahul. And uh, thank you for briefing about EV session. Pleasure. Uh, please share uh, registration details. Yeah, um, I, I was just sharing the registration details. But anyway, I'll send an email to everybody uh, so that you know you would be also able to get uh, a registration thing. Yeah, and. Uh, Pleasure, Rahul. Thanks, thanks a lot. And yeah, there's one more question from uh, Anusha. So, is the motor size dependable dependable on battery size or vice versa? Uh, fantastic question. Yep, they're sort of egg and chicken. If you if you're working in an OEM or sort of a thing, you would know it, right? So, so, but we would fix actually the performance first, right? So, that what performance I will fix? Uh, if we talk about, let's say, uh, I want my vehicle performance to be, let's say, zero to sixty within 3.5 seconds. So what Aether says, we were, they wanted zero to 40 in 3.9 seconds. That's what the target is. So they have targets, right? So on the gradability point of it, there's a target. There is an acceleration point of it, there's a target. So we fix these targets and then we say, okay, we will go back. So the moment you fix the target, it becomes a vehicle, it's a chassis. And that is actually what wheel has to deliver to run the vehicle. So when it has to go this way, so so basically the the, the wheel is, Tell asking it torque of this much and RPM of this much. So the the bat motor has to provide that, right? So when you define a parameter by top level, you're defining okay, this is my vehicle targets. The vehicle has to achieve this, it has to go through this drive cycle, all these parameters. When you're defining it, it, it becomes a top 
priority for you. So then you achieve the motor to uh, give you that uh, targets. Then if you achieve the motor, then you would go back and tell the battery, okay, boss, I need this and, and you have to deliver to me. There is no other way, right? So then, then you would, as an engineer, you would optimize it. But, but yeah, there is again, do you go back and tell, I have, we have done everything what we can do. This is the best with the pricing you have, the, what, what the team and the, the, the pricing point of it tells, right? So okay, you would, you would want some extra cells to achieve, but they say, okay, boss, this is the budget I have for this vehicle. This is the maximum cost of the battery, which you could achieve. Okay, just try out with few cells, try out with few other manufacturers. So this is sort of a chain which starts from your vehicle system definition, and then you drive the definition from to your wheel and wheel to your uh, motor or transmission, transmission to the wheel, sorry, transmission to the motor, motor to traction motor, and let's say traction to the battery, battery to the cell, and all these things into a place. This is the sort of step-by-step -step approach what you go through. So, okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Pawan, for joining the session. Uh, yeah, guys, if you're leaving, just, just share us a few feedbacks. If it was good and you, know, you sort of uh, learned something, I wasn't boring, I don't mind you know, taking some feedbacks from you. I'm just trying to put my efforts into a place so you guys can learn. And, and understand a bit about what we also have experienced a few months and few years in the past. So uh, do you mean, okay, there's a question from Akash. Mm, so do you mean motor size is directly depends on the fixed targets? I mean, max speed, uh, stopping distance and other stuff. Uh, yeah, so seriously, it would, you would, I, if uh, OEM point of it, if I say, if you say, okay, yeah, that's how I would define it. So I would define my targets and then I, I go down and down and down and define it. But again, there is an egg and chicken, okay? So there is an adjustment, right? So it's not just directly, okay, this is done. So there are adjustments down to like how people do it. Uh, there is a, any limiting for putting a transmission after a motor. Um, there is nothing such limiting. It's actually good uh, to optimize a motor size. Um, I don't know what you can do it. If, if you have sort of, you know, multiple gear ratios, it's good. But, but again, is it required as a one point? The second thing is, the cost point of it because you're putting extra two gears and, and that's a cost, an assembly cost, a manufacturing cost, a shipping cost, a design cost, everything, right? So it, it's, it's all optimal what you want to do. You can run simulation, it gives you results. Harsh, yeah, um, uh, yeah, thanks. And Ganesh, thanks. Uh, yeah, so the payment is only credit card. Uh, Rahul, uh, if you have challenges with the credit card, yeah, because we we also work with a lot of international uh, students, so so and and the companies, so we been accepting credit card. But nothing to worry, you can you can talk to us personally, so I would be able to help you out. Uh, so how you will be able to do it? Okay, uh, maybe I would just drop my text privately to you, so you could just drop me a text, and I should be able to help you, Rahul. Nothing to worry on that. Okay. Uh, Cool. So yeah, guys. So there are ten coupons. If you're very serious about taking it up, uh, you can you can definitely participate. I'm expecting this course fee is definitely going to increase uh, in the future. So great, and uh, that's it from my side. And I believe I've done my justice. And I I hope you had uh, fun learning with me and you know, getting some knowledge and insights about uh, EVs. I'm sure the day doesn't stop here. Uh, Keep attending webinars from Decibels and, and they're always free for you and then spread a word. Um, anything that, that goes to everybody uh, so that, you know, we, we need a lot of engineers. That's a very important thing because, because there is no college such which offers you, let's say, uh, a master's in electric vehicle. But even though they're offering, I don't know really because they have experienced engineers teaching these subjects. Our experienced domain experts are there to teach the subjects because industry themselves are struggling to get a right resources because there is no big expertise available, right? So I don't know, learning some theory and then you know, learning some same thing would really help you. But if you're if you're very serious about EV career, uh, take it up seriously. So uh, decibels can help you in play, into place by by making projects which is real time because that's what industry really cares. Okay, they don't care what theory knowledge you have but you know that's only possible when you put up things into a place and you know, that convert it into a practical application you could visualize things right so we, are, we could help you out and you know spending time with you if you're very serious about learning on evs and yeah there is definitely a potential future uh, for somebody who, who have a specialization in evs because uh, what mckenzie report says that you know uh, uh, there is a, a quite a large amount of uh, 
you know, vehicles which have been planned to get released uh, into a market within 2023. And McKinsey is very amazing, a uh, top-notch consulting firm. If they're saying it, they would have enough done data and research about it, right? So, so this, this again, demands you. If you go to Europe, uh, I have a lot of friends in, in foreign countries and they're working on this EV systems. Guys, they're, they're not talking about EV. They're not talking about IC engines. They're already moving totally to EVs, right? So, so having that in a place, you can, you can like, you know, like uh, work in EVs so that it, 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 your future is potential. For guys out there, for mechanical engineers, for any engineers, EV is not something only for uh, non uh, cold. So I have future webinars which are coming up on telling, okay, what is career opportunities for mechanical engineers in EV? And what is career opportunities for a electrical engineer in EV? What are the career opportunities for a ENT students in EV and computer science students in EV, right? I'm coming up with these webinars. Um, you know, uh, maybe you can attend them, which gives you more deeper insights. Because when I graduated, I did not know, okay, I should know this so I can get a job. So I possibly think these sessions will help you out uh, to, to explore, um, you know, uh, uh, where you really fit, right? Because, because you just take a course, which is like, you know, you don't like it later on. And you don't know how specialization I can become. You don't know what is the future of this course, what domains are there, what streamlines are there. Rather than just all these things, you could, you could take up these webinars, which, which they can guide you. You don't have to attend, let's say, paid sessions from Decibel, but you can still participate and you know, get a direction for your own uh, career, right? So that's, that's pretty much from my side, which I can put it across to you. This is my email address, which is right here, suraj at the Um I will always reply back as early as possible. Uh, things promise me right away, but if not, at least taking some time. So yeah, and uh, for everybody else, I could just drop my contact number uh, in, in the text here. So yeah, that's my number. Uh, if you have anything, just drop me a WhatsApp. So please don't just directly call, just drop a text and maybe in the sessions and, and something else. So you may have to, you don't have to feel bad, I didn't pick the call, just drop a text. I, I would usually in WhatsApp, I can reply back to you and you can take the conversations ahead. All right, uh, so wonderful and uh, Thank you very much for participating in the session. And it was amazing to interact with you. Happy to see so many people interested in EVs and definitely we're looking forward to help you as much as possible in the EV sector. And um, thank you very much. Good night, uh, stay safe, uh, keep learning and keep enjoying. Um, thank you, bye. Okay. So, okay. Oh. so I wanted uh, you had this uh, master class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Master. I'm working. I'm working professional. I'm not sure whether I'll be able to spend uh, so much time in weekends yeah. for this course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, my main area of focus in my uh, my field is this uh, powertrain cooling. So oh, right, right, I, right. I I just now started my career, not even six months ago. No worries, yeah. So I did my project in EVs and uh, service, uh -huh. but I don't have in-depth uh, knowledge. So okay, uh -huh. uh, currently we are working on plant and controller models. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. uh, is there, uh, you said that you have a plant models focusing course on EV uh, masterclass. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I uh, may know how in deep uh, you'll go. Yeah. So, uh, yes, Pranay, very good question. Uh, so, in terms of uh, plant models, uh, uh, what we're trying to build is the objective of the this, this course on BMS is basically that there's a course on cell and a pack and a BMS. So in the cell, basically, we would, we would build a model of the cell and, uh, and also model it more advanced than what we are modeled in uh, uh, course on simulation, where we'll be able to study, okay, how uh, thermal 
will be effect on the battery cell, I would say. And let's say how the SOC will be uh, affected by a battery and SOH and parameters and things like that. That's what we do as a part of the course in cell. And then we will move ahead in, into a, a, I would say a battery. We will be able to study more on the thermal side of it, but at a pack level, what really happens. Um, and, and when you put up more number of cells together, how the heat generation and, and all the heat dissipation has been happening in the, in the pack level. And then we would go in, in BMS. Actually, uh, that is where we, you know, uh, I say, build a whole model of a controller and also the plant. And okay. where we will be able to, okay, give certain inputs uh, from the drive cycle, which actually you have built a model of the vehicle. No? So yes. there you have a data of all the uh, current being drawn from the uh, battery and things like that. Mm -hmm. yes. Where actually you would be able to feed the drive cycle requirement, let's say the C rating of the battery and the current of the battery into okay. the model of a BMS. And then that would again you know, propagate into the, the pack and then to the cell. And then you okay, can okay. see how, how this is being affecting the cell temperatures and all these things. This is in terms of a plant model, which is taken from a vehicle model and then okay. subjecting into it. And also there are some uh, direct variations you can give it directly by, let's say, temperature parameters and things like that. So by putting it all together, you would be able to, let's say, the plant side of it. And then actually the controller side is on the BMS logics. So where you'll be able to actually put some algorithms and things like that. And okay. then the controller will be able to take care of the cell and BMS, cell and battery pack. And then the plant model will be able to give you the inputs of uh, all the, uh, the tra tractive requirements of the vehicle. Okay. So with respect to drive cycle, okay. how, yeah, uh, all the variations can happen and what regions, okay, what voltage of the cell, so, uh, cell has been there and things like that. Okay. okay. And uh, one day, uh, doubt I had is uh, when I gone through this BMS uh, mm -hmm. uh, course uh, preview, yeah, yeah. Uh, you focused on software part more. Uh, okay. Uh, in earlier uh, webinars, we, uh -huh. uh, you discussed about this thing called uh, code generation. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So, uh, whether you have uh, any content in the BMS course or master class course uh, where uh, you uh, design the, uh, you make your own algorithm uh, yeah. for the BMS, yep. and then you feed it into a microcontroller and uh, yeah. some other, uh, B, uh, I mean, like a programmable uh, BMS, yes. and yes. then you whether you can uh, make the pack itself. Absolutely. I mean, uh, that's the whole, uh, so what happens with the master class is actually, so um, see, you, you would learn and you would do a project and you will be able to take a minor project. These are the minor projects like a simulation of the vehicle and then these things like this. And then you can actually take a one major project. So which will be on any of the system. Maybe if you're interested in motor controllers, you can take a major project in motor controllers. There actually you'll be able to do all these things in depth. So that is the okay. objective of uh, I would say in terms of uh, a specialization in one thing, that's what a major project is. Minor projects are, everybody does, but depending upon their specialization requirements, they'll be able to take a major project and they'll be able to go deep dive. So okay. uh, yeah, you, you can take it as a major project where you'll be actually able to put the controller codes, like develop your own SOC algorithms and in the MATLAB itself, and okay. then you will be able to put it in a controller. But the problem is, uh, for you uh, have, having an access to MATLAB of an embed is very expensive. And uh, yeah. I, I, you would know it, right, from the perspective of... Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, so we have a license, a partner license. So, so we can actually give you that, you know, uh, process in like, you know, a, a way how it can be done. But to the level, you can build a controller model, but we can actually, you can, if you're interested, you can come down to our office. So uh, in Bangalore, uh, when if you take a master course, yeah, you can come down to our office and then you'll be able to do these projects and, and then implement it to a controller. And also before and that, also my engineers can do all these things and keep it ready for you. You would be able to like, you know, put your logic and things like that and then put it in a controller. And we would be working with TI. Uh, that's one of the BMS series we'll be working with, TI controllers. And, Texas uh, Instruments, right? Yeah, Texas Instruments controllers. And also a couple of... Uh, uh, this uh, linear technologies uh, we've mm -hmm. been uh, trying to start with because one of our partner has already developed a BMS which is commercially available. So we are in discussion with them. And also there is a one more uh, from NXP. Mm -hmm. So they have developed a BMS with NXP. It's a commercially available product right now into the market. Uh, they're a development company. They're a partner to develop this course actually. 
for us. So, so we, we should be able to do all these things. If you take uh, BMS as your master specialization, so uh, and and build these things and in, into it. Yeah. What I wanted to tell is that uh, uh, master class, uh, master class, uh, you have around uh, one year continuous, right? Uh, three uh, months. Yeah, three months of yeah, learning. Yeah, three months. Yeah, three months of learning plus another two, three months of projects. Yes, uh, I'm not sure whether I'll be able to complete everything within such a short period of time because as right. you know, yeah, yeah, my I company see. is uh, almost all companies are out of the city. I know, so we I have know. to travel at least uh, 100 kilometers up and down, oh God, that's coming right. to home, sleeping, nothing can be done. Right. So what I planned is that I thought of taking uh, courses as a separate module and then Huh. Doing, uh, doing, doing it uh, step by step. So right. that is what my plan was. Okay, okay, okay. I would definitely discuss how I can take it. I had your okay. requirements. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think uh, I suggested two persons from industry for this course. They both attended. Oh, <laughs> I don't want to mention their names. <laughs> both are both of them are uh, one of my one of them is my colleague and one of them is my alumnus. Fantastic. I am very thankful for that. I, I, I hope you know you enjoyed it. And, and Actually, uh, we both, uh, one more person who okay. was just senior in my com uh, company, uh -huh. we, we were interested on this battery algorithms and oh, so on. Right. Yeah, 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 so yeah. we are in that, actually we are very close in powertrain uh, model based design only we are working. Okay. So we, we thought of doing uh, our own DIY BMS just for our learning purposes because apart from company, we, we are not getting much time to spend or uh, time literally uh -huh. or learn something. Okay, okay, okay. So this is what uh, our plan was. So oh, right. That's why and, we uh, asked you. Uh, okay, okay. okay but I may just kind of show you this one, which we have done, um, maybe. So we, we're working on it. Uh, it would be interesting to show it to you, uh, which is, um, yeah. So this is this is like an other other project for a ENC kind of a student's background. Uh, so if you see this BMS which is here, which is in the background image. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, actually this is <clears throat> in a hardware measure. If you, somebody want to take a hardware measures in okay. uh, uh, BMS design, so uh -huh. we teach them like you know uh, they should actually at least have some PCB design knowledge and things like that. Okay, okay. Where actually they can design at their own BMS. Uh, so I know where they have a controller. And actually, mm -hmm. you put your uh, uh, MATLAB model into the controller, and you will be able mm -hmm. to evaluate. We have yeah. sort of a power resistors here, so you could dissipate with activating a switch, and you know put a one single cell, and you know simulate all these things. And we also yes, have yes. AI things, so they can also do that. Or else they can, if they want to be in a hardware design of BMS, they can actually take the major project in hardware design of BMS. And uh, we can collaborate one person from software side, one person from hardware side, and uh, they can complete a project. I think they can design it and manufacture it. So cost of manufacturing can be built by a partner, of it, but we, we guide them in, in doing it. So we have done some of the similar boards also. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is, yeah, that is that is in terms of, let's say, uh, hard, yeah, yeah. DIY thing, I can, I can share it through. We also have uh, sort of a BMS, which is you know something like this. I don't know whether you could see in my screen. Yes, yes, I can see it. I can see it. Yes. So, yeah. so this is something which we have. So uh, you know you could be able to sort of uh, build them and on your own and you know test them. We we play around, play the play play around. These are also like some of our interns who have built these things. Uh, so so who who joined with us and who worked with us. No worries, we can help you out. Like on the personal side of it, if it's something in like DIY. Okay, then uh, I'll just uh, discuss with, with, uh, yeah. with the colleague and uh, we'll get back to you. Fantastic, fantastic. Look forward, look forward. Uh, keep, uh, keep on uh, creating new courses. We are really sure. interested. Thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. Anything on EV is also passion for us. We'll, we'll definitely keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much and good day. Good night. Uh, good, good discussing with you. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much